Um, oh, Megan, I'm so excited. I'm so excited to talk to you. Um, I think we agreed beforehand that you're not going to read. Is that right? You're not going to read from the book. Yeah. It's better. Yeah. It's for the best for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a great reading voice. I must admit. <laughs> it's fine. I think, um, you know, we have what I always say when I read in public is like, when you want children to go to sleep, you read to them. And so sometimes like hearing someone's reading can be kind of like soporific. Um, but I do think that before we start talking about the turnout, your new book, it'll be useful to talk about what the turnout is about. And I, I, I know it's like difficult to distill it down, but I'm gonna make you give me your elevator pitch for what the turnout is about. Yeah, I mean, Michael set up the premise, but a little more about that. I mean, the Dara and Marie are these sisters who, who run this school and with Charlie, who's Dara's husband, but they've sort of raised each other. They have been this unit since childhood. Uh, Charlie was the protege of Dara and Marie's mother, who's the one who started this school. And so he came into their life at a very young age and then and then never left and then ended up marrying Dara. And they have been this sort of real triad, this unbreakable triad. But when the book begins, it's sort of starting to sort of tear away a bit. Marie, who's the younger sister, who's a little uh, a little more mercurial, um, she's starting to sort of bristle under their, their closeness and she has moved out of the family house, and sort of staying in the ballet school studio on the third floor. And that's the point at which Derek, this contractor, enters the space and he's sort of everything that they are not, uh, particularly for Dara, who wants to lose, you know, ballet is so much about control and rigidity and perfection and getting everything right. And Derek is just this force of chaos. He, uh, you know, he doesn't care about anything. He's literally supposed to be tearing the place apart. As right. Kind of do. Um, and she just sees him immediately as a threat where Marie in turn who has sort of felt so stifled is very drawn to him and so that sort of becomes the, the conflict brewing and they are ramping up for their big money maker which is this every ballet school knows that <laughs> Money maker is the annual production of the Nutcracker. It's when all girls, you know, it's why you start taking ballet so you can be in the Nutcracker and hopefully be, be Clara, the lead. Um, so they need everything to go well. This is the thing that supports them. And so it becomes this sort of pressure cooker, uh, this sort of private drama between the family, this outsider in their midst, and their sort of role in the community. And, and then things start to go very badly. <laughs> That's no spoiler. It, it, it is a thriller. <laughs> things, things start to go badly, but also the reader kind of understands the ways in which things have always been bad, right? Or the ways in which what has really been lurking under the surface of the, the family unit of these three people, these two sisters and one spouse. As you mentioned, right, the arrival of Derek, this contractor, precipitates a moment of crime, which is something that happens in a lot of your books. And the thing that I always wonder when I read novels that sort of involve crime is like, why, if you can hatch these plots, why you are yourself not a criminal? Like, it seems like it would be more lucrative to actually sort of like ex execute these crimes rather than just simply put fictional people through them. And so it made me wonder how it is, because I always think I would be a terrible criminal. I'm a terrible liar. I have a terrible poker face and I get really stressed out. Like I'm working on a story right now and I, there's a fact checker involved and I feel like so suspicious. I feel personally like I'm just deceiving him at all times. Like I'm just not, I don't have what it takes to like pull it off, you know? Do you have what it takes? Like, or do you, are you hatching these complex plots? No, I, I don't mean novelistic plots. I mean like the, the animating force of the books, which is actual conspiracy. Or are you drawing inspiration from things that you're reading about in the newspaper? Or, you know, are these like, like they used to say about Law and Order, are these ripped yeah. from the headlines? Yes, it's both weirdly. I mean, I'm not a criminal and I don't have a long con going <laughs> where I as an author. And I mean, it has happened a few times, but that's not me. But I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do draw a lot. I am a lover of true crime and tabloid stories and especially looking at them not particularly the way they're reported, but the yes. 
behind it, the drama, the psychology of it. But I think the part that makes me write crime novels that's personal is like a heavy sense of guilt <laughs> that I had. This is sort of a like a cafeteria Catholic, like you the things you let go and the things you carry with you. And like I've always identified with the people who are either done the crime or are trying to cover up the crime. That's why I never have an investigator as the main character or a reporter or anyone seeking the truth. I am always with the people attempting to conceal the truth. So that, that's that's my my dime store psychoanalysis of myself because it, it feels like it's so easy for me to get there and imagine, you know, it, you know, with so many eye books, how are we gonna hide this body? <laughs> right. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I hadn't I hadn't thought about that because there is a presence of authority in this book in in the figures of a police investigator and then an insurance investigator. But it's true that they're not entirely red herrings. They simply, they exist to provide the pressure that would be exerted on any sort of conspiracy. But the real tension, as you're saying, is like you as the reader are almost watching the people who have done wrong. And you're like, you're sort of, that's sort of part of what is so compelling about the book is that you yourself feel that guilty or that vicarious sense of like, where are you gonna, like you said, hide the body. That's not actually what happens, but like where, how are you gonna pull this off? And that's probably what, part of why it's so effective. I think it's about, I always have been so fascinated with, with books where you become complicit in it and, and like the trick that the writer pulls off. And in that moment when, even though you think this is all completely morally and ethically wrong, mm. but, but because you're with that person, you yeah. still into, no matter what you don't want them to get caught and and you you and then when they're being interviewed by the police or you know these you know this i mean all my, all my books there's like some police scene where you're on you're actually i mean the goal is that you're that the reader is both knows that they've done something wrong or are concealing a wrong thing but somehow does not want the police person to find yeah. out and yeah. it's that's the sort of sleight of hand I'm trying to pull off, or at least the, the reader's going back and forth in their feelings about it. Yeah, so it's an act of seduction by bad people. How do you, how do you create people who exert that kind of control? How do you create fictional people who exert that kind of control over the reader? How do you, how do you seduce them and soften the reader? It is a lot about, um, really having a kind for me it's being very close to their thoughts so I don't always do first person this book isn't yeah. but it is close third and once you start are following the thoughts um it, I mean witness Lolita it's very hard not yeah. to with, with yeah. the, because they are your your view of the world and and then I do try to make sure that I make them very three-dimensional very um you know, I, I try, I know sort of heroes and villains, um, but that everybody sort of has their corners so that there isn't that, but it's sort of um, um, trying to create these little windows where re different moments when the reader might feel sorry for that person or identify with their anxiety in the situation or, um, or have, I guess there's the old trick of having someone far worse than this person yes. <laughs> on the spectrum, you'll take that. Yeah. The animating force for me in writing is that is that constant conversation with the reader where I'm trying to make them stay with me. It's really effective in this particular work. And again, I don't like I there's so much pleasure in unfolding how the turnout works that I don't want to threaten that experience for the reader. But I will say that Derek, who we've just, you know, we've talked about, he's the contractor who arrives and kind of threatens the order of this school and this household. And there is something monstrous about him, but there's also something really seductive about him, even for the reader. And it's a tricky balance that I hadn't really, un until you mentioned it, I hadn't thought about how you were pulling it off, you know? Yeah, and he's sort of, I really want him to be right about a lot of things. Like there's things he's figuring out about the Durants that, um, and he's not wrong about it. And so that there would be this valley, like the closer he, the more time he spends with them, there's, there's, there's problems in that family has become clear. And he's, he is very astute about that. And like with anybody who, who wants something and Derek definitely has some things he wants, they're really good at figuring out the weaknesses. Um, mm -hmm. 
so that that's part of it too that um that he is um you know he's not a sort of twirling mustachio villain there. right right exactly he's not just like pure force of evil um the writer helen ellis is in the audience tonight and she has asked a question that i think is really interesting so i'm going to jump ahead to that question with a reminder that um everyone can ask questions in the q a button but Helen asked, you know, whether you start writing a novel with a crime or sort of the milieu of the group. And I'm really curious about that with, with respect to the turnout. Like, was it the central conspiracy that interested you or was it the idea of writing about a school of ballet? Yeah, that, you know, it is different for me from every book. And I, it's so great to hear from Helen who, Helen and I are in a puzzle club together. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and we talk about, this puzzle club, we talk a lot about crimes so <laughs> he knows but um it uh, usually usually actually it does start with the crime but then i have to have the voice and then and then if that's going but in this case i'd always wanted to write something set in a ballet school um and then the other piece was that i was really sort of fascinated by the but do you remember that podcast that was wildly popular about five years ago called dirty john and it yes yep. yeah so that uh, I was sort of riveted to that. It's about this sort of, in that case, it's a serial con artist who sort of romances to all these women and was a very dangerous person and committed a lot of crimes. And and when that podcast aired, I would look at the comment, never look at the comments, but <laughs> look at the comments. And there was so much, almost entirely by women, angry comments about the women that fell for him they were mm. so angry at it and i was really interested in that dynamic the way that it felt like they were um it was a way of pushing it away from themselves this could never happen to me and mm. sort of sort of that the complicated stuff with that um with that dynamic really interested me so i thought that if i had what what if it were these two sisters where one is right judgmental of the other's romantic yeah. choices, it's all her choices really, and 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 where that's coming from for her. So the, 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 the crime element sort of came from sort of creating this situation where something- Oh happened. yeah, that's interesting. So you mentioned a sort of pre-existing desire to write about a ballet school. And so I'm really curious about your own relationship to ballet. And, you know, there's so much, ballet is the, it's the milieu of the book. It's sort of the operating metaphors of the book, the title of the book. Actually, I would love if you explained what the turnout actually is, because I think that's a very important element of the book, as we can see, because you've given the, to, the title to it. But I would love to hear you talk about your own relationship to ballet. Yes, I mean, first, uh, the title, it, it's wild. You would think that that would have been the title from the start, because it's a great before <laughs> I, when I abuse, like, frequently throughout the book, but it really can very much later, because it is sort of a basic thing in ballet, which is to get that thing where, essentially, where you're, you're, you've actually, your, your legs are completely turned out. You have, you have, <sighs> you know gotten you know it sort of requires all this sort of muscle effort and stretching and to get there so that you have that that turnout that we so identify with ballet dancers and it's a kind of opening to the audience and it's um something that girls get at age 11 12 13 and is you know is is a kind of exhilarating moment even with the pain or especially with the pain um i never got to that i um, had that I think two years of ballet. That's the first two years. Um, but uh, I, I, I took ballet at this sort of strip mall studio in uh, suburban Detroit. And but the, it was run by two sisters. Um, mm. and were very glamorous they were identical twins in that case which i did not use for this book because that just felt too it's like <laughs> you know, real life is always better than fiction and you know, yeah so but we were all fascinated by them and that and like if they were, were rivalrous with each other what their history was what their romances were because they were so sort of serene and perfect you could never guess what was going on behind their eyes and like 
to me, that was so much what ballet was about. It was about this sort of pearly facade that was just immaculate and exquisite. And, you know, what, what was sort of behind that? Um, so it, it had this sort of enchantment for me. Um, so I knew that I would one day uh, it would it would end up in, in one of my books. And, you know, I had to wait to Black Swan. I had to wait to <laughs> Black Swan, but, uh, um, but I knew I would eventually. It's very, you know, a, a few years ago, I took my, I chaperoned a field trip for my younger son's class to a uh, ABT, like in the school's performance. And I always remember this because uh, one of the little boys in my group who I was monitoring, we were sitting and watching the ballet. It was like these extraordinary performers. And this little boy sitting next to me said, oh, I can see that guy's butt. And I was like, yeah. In some ways that is like ballet is like, it's both sort of like neutered and profoundly sexual. And even hearing you talk about what the turnout literally is, and I wish I had it flagged, but there's a section in the book where you describe the Durant sisters' mother speaking to them of the moment at which she achieved this perfect opening of the body that is really <laughs> intense. Like it, it provides, there's, you're having, I, I sensed in this book, a writer having a lot of fun with the metaphoric possibility of the form and the language and to talk about the body. There's a lot, this is a very bodily book. It's a very sweaty. So it's it's sort of like, you're talking about the enchantment of a girl's relationship to putting on pink and feeling like the princess, but what you're writing about from the adult perspective or the writer of, especially one interested in the darkness in the world, it lets you talk about sex and sort of grotesquery and smell and physicality. It's it's not, I guess maybe Black Swan is a closer analog. It's not ballet in the way that like, it's not like sweet girls in tutus. No, it's not. And it, you know, and it, I mean, I guess one of the things that I didn't really discover till I was writing the book, which is sort of goes with exactly what you're saying is, I hadn't, I had always seen the Nutcracker. I always go see the Nutcracker, but I had never read the E.T.A. Hoffman story before. Yeah. And I had never really thought about the play, um, of the, the actual story of the ballet. And it's, once you look at it, it's much darker than you think it yeah. was. Never our memories. I mean, the Balanchine version that we all know so well is in some ways very sanitized, but it, it, the actual story is about this young girl, uh, right sort of before puberty. And she's, your godfather comes, to this sort of creepy older godfather who wears an eye patch, gives her this little boy, this doll, this little man. No. It's a no. And she is enthralled with it and wants to take it to bed with her. No. It, and then it unfurls this elaborate fantasy where she has a prince and she goes to this sort of um, exotic land from which she never returns. So it's yeah. it's such a metaphor for coming of age, for yeah. acting, sexuality. And it, so it's like in both cases, it's like it was there all along. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, like with most things that are for children, the children respond to them for all kinds of reasons. But one is that like with fairy tales, that there is something about that darkness, that these are these going to be these things that are going to be unfurled for you. And you yeah. peek a little bit behind the curtain. And then we as adults look at it and we can't believe that, that yeah. our children access any of this. Yeah, that's, I think that's, have you ever read a book by Alison Lurie called Don't Tell the Grownups? No. It's a it's a sort of academic study of the literature for children from the world over and the ways in which, as you're saying, literature for, ch for children from the adult, from our perspective and our memory, it's like sweet and lovely, but actually most narrative throughout time is didactic. And so it will sort of like tell you the truth about something and that that's part of the attraction for children is that adults never tell them the truth. And so narrative for children can kind of come closer to telling them the truth. And, and some of these darknesses are sort of embedded in narrative convention. Like in every Disney movie, the parents have to die in order to like propel the story. Um, but that brings me to, I, I'm gonna read, uh, I'm gonna read something from the book. Here's a quote. There's no context necessary for the audience. <clears throat> she supposed it was like all children's stories, all fairy tales always much darker, stranger than you guessed. 
children themselves much darker, stranger than you guessed. I mean, I'm hearing you say that, I'm hearing you acknowledge that that was in mind, but I wondered whether, like, I thought a lot about the Gothic because one element of this book is, it's set in this dance studio, but there's a, there's a lot of business in this book about the house that these girls share. And it feels very Gothic. And I wondered if you were specifically thinking about any fairy tales, any films, any books, any other kinds of stories that would be familiar as you were building the world of this book. Yes, I mean, I certainly was really did want that gothic energy where the I mean, it's and it's also that sort of with Freud, the house is the is your person, right? Yeah. So um, I sort of flipped it with the the attic is the basement, but uh, right. and, um, that there are all these secrets that lie in it, particularly for the Durants because they are still living in their childhood home, and so this notion of being things like great gardens or so like where time right. is stopped in the house and then you know I was not consciously aware of this at the time but my editor Sally Kim pointed out when we were editing it flowers in the attic which is a, not only a oh right yeah as a kid, but I've actually written about for the paper <laughs> but somehow I never put together because that's also that's about wow. children are actually imprisoned in the attic and the daughter is a ballet dancer <laughs> right I had, and so that, and I, and of course that's a novel that young, uh, young girls love or, um, yeah. and not just young girls, but that was a book that was published as an adult book, but now we never think of it as an adult book, though we should, because it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's still the film. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, I mean, the fact that at age 10 or 11, we just can't, you know, it, yeah. that, keyhole cover was the house and then the the kids in the window and then this keyhole and you would you would open it up and I think just even that gesture and understanding that about children and how they want one to go in there and the, that you know all houses are haunted and uh yeah all that stuff was I think sort of you know, floating in my brain um because I hadn't intended the house to be as important as it became but it did become this this object especially when they have this sort of repair figure like Derek, whose job is essentially to tear apart buildings, houses, homes, workplaces, etc. Oh, that is so interesting to me that you just said you hadn't intended for the house to figure in the book in exactly the way you did, because I wanted to ask, like, when you're writing about crime, like, there, crime, it's like, there's a logic to it, like, it's sort of like, it's contingent, it's sort of formulaic, it's, it has to be like, the A, the B, the C. And the way that you write about it to sort of yield the most pleasure on the part of the reader is you reveal the end and then you go back to the beginning. But that creates a circumstance where you have to be, I would imagine, very control in control of how the book fits together. So I'm, I guess this is a way of asking like the extent to which you have a strategy, a plan, an outline, and the extent to which you were, like you just said, the, the house became more important as you, as you, than you had intended. Like, how do you balance that, the imperative to kind of improvise as you're going through? Yeah, I mean, it would, I mean, I do know some crime writers that are really meticulous in their planning and pretty much stick to it, um, particularly if, if, if you have an investigator and you're sort of setting out clues and because crime readers are great readers and they will really catch you if you make yeah. <laughs> um, and so I, I I I have a more broad structure I know the sort of the three acts of the book and they rarely change but the emotional tenor of all of that definitely cha changes and the sort of um, way of sort of generating the sort of hot house energy I'm trying to keep alive through the whole thing is, you know, I don't really know the characters until the more I write and then they reveal themselves. Yeah. Once they yeah. reveal and then that, you know, I had this image early on of Dara Marie as children in this bunk bed. And I became obsessed with the notion of this bunk bed and how it held all their secrets. And so that then it became the, you know, everything sort of became like, you know, you have to kind of, I don't know, for me, I have to kind of open up the unconscious and let this sort of stuff come in. Some of it goes away, but the stuff that sort of takes hold and that everything about that house took hold. Um, and, and, and I felt like I had to stay with it um, for that reason reason this is not I don't think I had this question when I emailed you but it's something I meant to ask I was going to ask you before we started but I'm going to ask you in front of the audience so you mentioned hot house it's like a very useful 
metaphor for what's happening inside of the book. But I wondered if you wrote this book in the summer or the winter, because it is a very winter book. And there was a great, I read this book uh, last week or the previous week, and there was a great pleasure in reading about winter in the summer. Like, do you have a relation? Do you know what I'm asking about? Like, do you have a relationship to that as like the person in reality writing the thing? Yeah, it, it gets me there. It does. I mean, I did write most of this during two winters, and uh, um, and it. I mean, so I have done the reverse, which is we were talking about as a reader, but where I go, want to go. I find myself going opposite. I have the a book, the end of everything, which is entirely a summer, and I wrote it entirely in the winter because I wanted it to be summer. But yeah. So it, it that does get get you know it, it does get in there, but this it felt like. Um, it felt like it had to be cold. And then it was, and then, it, then sort of the nutcracker element. Fit. Of course, yeah. That, that sort of gave me an anchor, an excuse to write about it. But it is, it is such a mysterious thing. When I read Leave the World Behind, which is set in the summer, I read it during April of lockdown, I think it was. Yeah. And yeah. It was we couldn't, it was still very cold and not only that, yeah but you couldn't really go outside at that point. Yeah, yeah. And sirens everywhere. Yeah. Um, but your book does not have a summer one necessarily. One right, summer. right. But I also, I wrote that in winter from okay. in, in part with the same, like to me there, it was more powerful to imagine what summer was like from the distance of winter. I could hold on to it better. And so, and when I was reading the turnout, there's, and none of this is like, it's not key stuff, but it's really important to the atmosphere of the book. There's descriptions of like children wearing scarves or like wet wool on a radiator and all this stuff that just felt so deeply wintry. And I was like, God, was it winter when Megan wrote this? Like, or was she just remembering that these are like the atmospheric conditions of winter? I just was so curious to know the answer to that, you know? Part of it probably was going back to my memories of, you know, I grew up in Michigan where it's always, yeah. so yeah. I, ballet class, I do remember the changing room being sort of, it's just this enormous pile of kids outerwear, like all sort of mounded on top of each other. And that was a sort of central memory and then getting really hot in rehearsal and then having to put on all these layers and layers. Yeah and the disorientation of that. So that was definitely in there. And then, you know, I was, I do deal with space heater issues, which are, it's not a yeah. space, really part of the novel, space heater plays a role. And uh, um, so it's funny how that stuff gets in there. It's like, you're looking yeah. for something to make it feel vivid or real for you so that it will for the reader. And, and some of it doesn't make sense and it goes away and, and some of it stays. Yeah, no, it was, it was deeply effective. I've never, I've never lived in Michigan. I've never taken ballet class, but I was really, I felt really there. There's a lot of the language. I mean, I, I told you this already. I think it's an extraordinary book, but I really felt like that's, I was in that moment, in that place. And I'm so curious, especially because I know over the last couple of years, your work has taken you away from just like strictly being at your desk writing novels. You've worked in television and I wonder whether you feel that that's had any kind of effect on the way that you think of how fiction operates, like whether you've learned anything or whether you think that they're just two separate endeavors that you happen to do both. Yeah, I, you know, I really think they're so different. They're, and um, it's not like the one, it's not like these thoughts don't come into my head when you, you know, script, when you're writing a script, structure is everything. You have no room to move. Everything is about um, escalation. And there's like, there's just no room for the excursion that to me make novels so delicious. Um, yeah. You can't really get into someone's head. You have to find other ways to do that. Um, and TV writing is so deeply collaborative. So it, it, you know, you're in a room with writers, you're working with producers, you're working with directors, and it's sort of these, you know, it's sort of the opposite, which is good because having come off you know, having a show in production and the intensity of that and the, all that collaboration and then being able to like retreat to the novel where I could do anything I wanted and no, yeah. one, and no one could complain to me about the budget. You know, right. Thing. right. So, you know, there's, um, 
there's a great glory in, in writing for TV because you do get to collaborate with visual people and most writers are, are we're not very visual and the way that they can, a director can figure something out that you spend five pages in a novel trying to create the atmosphere of the studio and the, the mufflers around the neck and, the, and they could in one shot make yeah. all those things. And that's great, but I, uh, I really try to, um, keep it separate um, and not let the TV writer brain enter the novelist brain and vice versa because it feels like feels like it could be a problem. <laughs> yeah, and you know it's funny because actually there's a, there's a specific theme in the turnout in which Dara is remembering attending a carnival as a child. It happens it, it, it recurs throughout the book and, and and something that she saw that I do I can imagine a producer saying to you like no we're not doing a flashback. I, we can't cast actors to play these the principals as kids. We we just don't have it in the budget. And it's not it's not a, it's not an integral part of the novel, but because you're in control of the novel, you can have it there and it accomplishes what you want it to accomplish, which is deepening your understanding of these women as children, adding a sort of letter, layer of metaphoric language. And it's just fun. You know, I just, again, I said this to you when, I, when we talked before, I sense a writer who is having so much fun writing in this book. And I think that that sort of translates for me as I was reading it, I was like, oh, this is so fun. Like it's just going in this, ways that are so unpredictable. Oh, that makes me so happy. And that it's so funny you say that about the carnival because I'm writing the um, pilot for the limited series based on the yeah. And the first scene I wrote is a carnival. I'm like I'm gonna put it in now so no one can tell me. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's, because it, I, and I think that's right because it establishes something very important about the dynamic between the sisters and the relationship to their parents. And if it's not, you could make the story make sense without it, but the fact that its presence deepens your understanding of the story. And like, it's a novelistic touch and it's not an economical screenwriter touch. So maybe I think you're right to keep those selves separate. Although it must get hard when you're adapting your own work. Yeah, but, it, but it is it's, it is so interesting because uh, it's the part, like when you, in TV you have to fight for the things that you want that cost money or, the, or yeah. really everything. So you have to, you know, you have to mount your defense. And so um, it, it, it makes you realize what's most important to you. And so it's, I think that there's something wonderful about the novel where you really have this sort of close dynamic with the reader where you really know what you, what you, the reader needs to know. And you need to tell that you owe it to them to tell them that. And, and then, you know, you can sort of winnow it down. But I, I don't know, I, I love that, that relationship. I love keeping that sort of quivering. I mean, I thought of that so much with your book um, is that quivering, like holding back, only yeah. giving them so much, only, yeah. you know, keeping them on the line hovering it um and and sh and then sort of often just sort of pulling it right out from under that yeah, yeah. i think yeah i consider those books for readers you know re real readers yeah that's an interesting that's interesting because i think what you're there is a pact between author and reader and i think like the terms of the pact of the turnout are that you're going to satisfy. You're gonna like tell me what actually happens. And when it ha the satisfaction I felt when I got to the end of this book and, and what I was waiting for to happen happened in a way that I didn't necessarily predict. And I think it's like good to not try and solve mm -hmm. a crime novel. I think it's really good to like allow, you, allow the narrative to carry you there. It was so satisfying. I mean, my book is like annoying because it doesn't, it's, its intent is to provoke you and not deliver that particular satisfaction, but like, because there is something about the resolution of a story. It's as old as like the unmasking of the murderer is so satisfying as a reading experience that like, you just, I don't know, I can't even, I just, I was reading it on the beach and when I got to the end, I was like, oh, thank God. Like I, it, <laughs> it happened the way I thought it was gonna happen, but yeah. it was better than I thought it was gonna happen. And that's such a profound, as you say, it's like about that relationship between you as the writer and the person reading the book. Right, you know? it's fair. And I always try to give what I consider like the twin ending that, that my favorite crime novels do where you resolve the mystery 
but you also try to tell the reader, but this is actually the more important part. I'm gonna tell you something else that's more important. Um, and that, so then, you know, and then, so then someone that doesn't care about that part, which is fine, they have their answer, but there's something else for the people that are, have gotten very attached to the characters, that there's something yeah. that, that they want there. And hopefully that the idea, I always try with the ending is to do both. That's, that's the sort of trick I'm going for. Yeah, that's funny because, and I think that's so true of all of your work, is that there is a crime, there is a sort of thing happening that you're waiting to have resolved, but in some way it's less interesting than the people in the world you're writing about, and reality doesn't have those tidy solutions, and so that part of the work doesn't have those tidy solutions, and the turnout is not an exception, but you still you build to a moment that I found deeply satisfying. You know, I think it's like, it, it's really like, it's not easy to do. Um, we have some like very, very interesting, like sort of general audience questions about your approach to the routine. And I'm, I'm always curious to hear writers talk about that. Like, are you someone who feels you have to write daily? Are you someone who writes for two hours or for six hours? Do you write in the morning, do you write at night? Like, do you have a kind of habit about this kind of thing or what's your approach to that? Yeah, I mean, I used to have a real set pattern of writing first thing in the morning and, and I had all this sort of, I had a real regime down and then and then I started working in TV where I'd have all these deadlines and, and you know, have to keep switching things. And, and then we had a pandemic and then it's, yeah. and so, but really what it is is, is that I've sort of understood, I do write every day and and by, but when I say writing, I mean all the parts that we know that are writing, which are yeah. often taking the walk, thinking about the story problem, um, reading something that you know will get you in this space. Um, sometimes just sort of writing in the voice of one character just to sort of get it going. So I'm not, you know, it's not just me sitting there like, I mean, I wish it were <laughs> just typing. <laughs> Um, so it, I, I tried to sort of understand how important all that other stuff is to it and how, I mean, how many writers, and I know this has to be true for you, the minute you step away from the computer, you figure out the problem you couldn't solve. Yeah six yeah. hours that you were sitting there so so that so and I you know I mean there's certain things like I never have lunch with people because I don't want to break up that kind of state that is so this is th that alone is such good advice and another writer told me that I I once there's another writer who I'm friends with and I was like oh let's have lunch and she said oh no no I don't have lunch I never ever have lunch it ruins the best part of your day and it's that is really good advice because you will find any, if I'm having lunch with someone, first I think, oh, I'm not going to get anything writing done after lunch. But then yes. I'm going to get anything done before lunch. Because you think, yeah. I'm yeah. at this restaurant. Mm, my God. Yeah. How long will it take me to get, you know, you, you, you will, I will always cling to an excuse not to write. So so no lunches um, is, is, is a real solid for me. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. And so you mentioned, like, I, I do have that experience of, uh, the second I step away or I'm taking a shower or going for a walk or something, I do have clarity about whatever it has been lurking in my head. Are you someone who carries a notebook? Are you someone who so scribbles things down all over the place? Or how, like, how does that all, how does it all coalesce ultimately? I used to scribble and I still do somewhat, but mostly I just send emails to myself on my phone, which is I like, that too. Yeah. yeah. And it, <laughs> and it can be weird sometimes. Well, there's also someone that has almost my exact same email address that sometimes it's, <laughs> I don't know how, cause she's in there because she's almost forward. To right. Me. <laughs> and it's often like really, often really forensic details. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> about it now but I, I do like it's, it's often an exchange of dialogue it's um it's a little mm -hmm. thing but it's also can be great then when you sit back down and you have this email from yourself that can sort of be that sort of spark to get you writing again so that yeah. primary way oh I love hearing that you do that because I do that too and I will email myself things that don't make any sense and um, I often wonder like, cause my kids will sometimes look at my phone or something and I'm like, I'll have sent myself an email and the subject line is just like OJ Simpson. Yeah. And then I'll be like, well, what do you, like, what, are, like, what is somebody going to deduce from these insane emails that I send myself? I also often do it late at night. Like sometimes when I'm half awake, I'll think of something and I'll email myself and go back to sleep. And yeah, it's, it's weird, but it's funny. I, ha I have a very similar relationship to my phone. <laughs> 
think it can be sometimes like, I don't know, it gets you in this different headspace. Maybe it's sort of how like the romantic post used to do automatic writing. Like there's something. Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. That you don't get caught up in in the language or or anything, and I, I kind of love that. Sometimes I just sort of paste a bunch of them in a document together and just sort of hold them as a kind of touchstone. I mean, you know, there's so many superstitions that that we have as writers, and uh, when it's sort of whatever is working. But that has worked for me. Mm, I'm gonna try that actually. I'm gonna try and stitch them all together and see what I come up with. That's good advice. Um, I knew that this evening would fly by and indeed it has flown by. Um, but the, the question I wanted to close with is like, if we were doing this in person, which God willing, someday we'll do it again in person. Um, I know that like, I can't go into a bookstore. I can't go into books for magic without buying something. It's like a weird compulsion. Um, so, you know, everyone can buy your book right now using the link that's in the chat, but I'm curious to know what you would have bought tonight, what you would have been unable to resist buying if you had been in the store. Oh my gosh, I have two if it's okay, because uh, I, I can't, they're both on my list. In fact, when I go to sign books and books are back. <laughs> but one is, it doesn't come out until next week, is Julie Clams, the almost legendary Morse, yeah. which is, I think it's sort of unsolving a family mystery about her grandmother's cousins with these sort of legendary women. And I think Julie sort of un unpacks the um, what appears to separate the fact from the legend um, and it sounds delicious. And the other one which comes out tomorrow is Naomi Hirahara's Clark and Division. She has this wonderful series um, set in California in the 40s. And this is about a family that is interred, um, this Japanese American family that's interred for the entire war. And then they're let go and they're resettling in Chicago. And on the way, the daughter, one of the daughters disappears. And wow. So wow. That. But that time period and that world, um, I, I can't wait for uh, that. So I, I intend to make some purchases. <laughs> yes, I'm sure you do. Well, it's such a pleasure. I I really, truly loved this book so much. It was such a great joy to talk to you about it. Um, Megan is going into Books for Magic. You guys heard her. She's going to be there signing books. So the link is in the chat. You should absolutely get a signed copy. This book is incredible. You're going to read it too quickly because it's impossible to resist. Uh, Megan, congratulations. It's called The Book is Out Sporo. You, must, you should feel great. You should feel great. Thank you so much for, and for doing this. As you oh, know, of course. I've read all your books and I'm eagerly anticipating the next one. I, I hope you're not actually vacationing at any point. No, I'm, I'm working. I'm working. So okay. stay tuned. Yeah.